Mitch Gallagher, welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We are at GearFest 2013 and we are joined by drummer extraordinaire Terry Bozio. Howdy. Thanks for coming in. Glad Thank to have you, you here. Much. Appreciate it. Uh, just in from uh, Japan. Yeah. Fighting a little jet lag and. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah, it's that's okay all because okay. GearFest is amazing. Yeah. And you're going to be doing a workshop with, yeah. the, with the big kit for uh, DW Drums. Right? Yeah, I think John's going to do uh, 15 minutes of, uh, you know, explaining the. The beauty of how he makes shells and drums and uh, right. then I'm gonna play and uh, have some fun you know right. I, every day I get to play is a really good day that's awesome that's awesome so you have a tremendous catalog and a tremendous uh, list of musicians and people that you've worked with but starting back at the beginning you're from San Francisco yeah and you actually have a formal education as yeah. a drummer so you yeah. studied yeah I, uh, I was kind of a late starter but I, I uh, you know got, had some formal lessons for six months, learned how to read the rudiments and stick control, things like that. Had good teachers. Then I just played in garage rock bands through uh, high school. And then my last year of high school, I started to study music uh, seriously okay. and play with the band and things like that. Went to college for two, two years and got uh, an AA degree in music and, uh, you know, learned uh, all the basics like uh, the names of the notes on the staff. And sure. I, and then from there, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to... Um, you know, get some great gigs around San Francisco, which led me to getting the gig with Zappa. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, ever since then, I, I've been just chipping away at, at, at moving forward, you know. Right. Uh, you don't know, you're not always conscious of that um, musically. You know, your, your motives are always like, you know, I want to be rich and famous or something twisted. Sure. But after a while, uh, when you've had that and you know it's an empty, you know, empty box, uh, then you start making music your hobby and you realize how fun it is and what a beautiful thing it is and really what a metaphor it is for the whole universe because everything is vibrating and uh, everything is in tune with each other uh, according to the law of the octave you know mm -hmm. um, a tempo can be a frequency if it's within 20 to 20,000 hertz and you know uh, slower than that you can maybe a, a g or something is the you know an earth year or what have you, and uh, the color in the trillions of cycles per second, the color red orange. Sure. So, you know, all that stuff really means music is a metaphor for w where we are in the universe. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, just uh, I can't think of anything that makes me feel more uh, wonderful, you know, satisfied uh, than, than, you know, having a, a night where you actually get it right, you know, where <laughs> something comes through you that isn't you and makes something beautiful and, and, and is, you know, uh, transmitted to the audience. Right, so, what a wonderful experience to have that happen. It's the best. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that stands out about your career is the way you've gone from, uh, I think you were actually playing in a big band, you were playing in jazz groups, then you played with Zappa, yeah. and then with the Brecker Brothers, UK, yeah. Missing yeah. Persons. How do you make those moves from those different styles? And, well, and, I, think, I think they start to boil inside you, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, um, uh, for me, uh, I liked, when I was playing in garage bands, I liked uh, Mitch Mitchell, who was one of my favorite drummers with Jimi Hendrix. So he's a consummate rock drummer. John uh -huh. Bonham and, and Ginger Baker, of course, as well. So then you get into jazz and you hear Elvin Jones and Tony Williams, Jack DeJeanette, Eric Gravatt. These guys are just geniuses with four-way coordination and all the freedom they had when they played. So that really made me aspire to want to do that. Then, you know, in, in the education system and what was happening around me at the time in San Francisco were opportunities to play jazz and to uh, fulfill those fantasies. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly, uh, you know, 
fusion starts to creep in and Miles and Weather Report and Billy Cobham and Mahavishnu Chikri are all bringing more rock influences. Right. So, you know, you try and do that and learn these odd times. And then before I knew it, there was a, a opportunity to audition for Zappa and I got with him and I kind of had to rediscover how to play rock and roll. And Mitch Mitchell was one of my kind of guideposts. I, you know, I I'd do something that was just too out for Zappa to feel, and he'd go, "Now that's an example of what not to do on stage." So, <laughs> I would go back and try and think of a Mitch Mitchell lick with Jimi Hendrix or something, and and come back to rock and roll from you know the three piece, you know, fly in a bottle, right. Gretsch jazz kit or something. Sure. Uh, approach to drumming. So yeah, then. You know, by the time I finished with Zappa, um, I think my ego had grown uh, to the point where I wanted to do something. And he, he felt actually that it was time for me to go do my own thing. So he mm -hmm. kind of bumped me out of the nest like a good father. And uh, I, you know, uh, had the opportunity to play with uh, Eddie in the middle year of, Jap of Zappa. So when it wasn't working out with uh, Bill and Alan in UK, uh, they asked me to join. So, mm -hmm. so there was my step to being kind of a, a member of a band as opposed to a side man. And uh, uh, you know, I, I went from there to uh, you know, form Missing Persons because you know, as we were getting some success with UK touring around, the critics were saying, oh, this is a dinosaur band. It was self-indulgent and all this other stuff. And, and they were comparing us to bands that I had never been influenced by, like Yes and, and uh, ELP and whatnot. And right. I'm like, that's not me. You know, I, I, I've never even heard these guys. And, right. and, so, uh, and also, music was changing. The punk revolution had happened. And I was kind of influenced by that. So uh, I, I moved into Missing Persons that way. And I guess the twist was, you know, we had three Zappa guys who could really play mm -hmm. and uh, write. And we put that with my ex-wife, uh, Dale, who was the eye candy. And that seemed to work. You know, the first time the gimmick worked. The next time, you know, wasn't, didn't work. So, you know, then you kind of move on. And sure. I found myself sort of beached. I thought, I'm, I'm a singer, songwriter, and drummer. And I want to do like Phil Collins and, you know prove to everybody that I'm, I'm the one who was the brains behind Missing Persons. Right. <laughs> and that ended up me up, you know, being beached. I got like loads of money from several different record companies to do demos and just one song they gave me 10 grand to do, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and still rejected me. So I started to practice uh, again and I thought, you know, what am I doing? I'm already known as this very complicated drummer who can play, you know, the Black Page with Zappa and play with the Brecker Brothers. If I get any better, it might alienate me more from the music business. Mm. But it was like a meditation for me. It was like a therapy. So I would just practice these ostinato patterns and how to solo against them. And uh, I felt better. And then somebody said, hey, do a clinic. And uh, I went out and did, did the clinic thing. And uh, I found I had this wonderful group of drummers who wanted to learn, wanted to know about what I was doing. There wasn't any commercial restrictions. Mm -hmm. So I experimented with trying an ostinato on them one time, you know, after I did my typical 10 year old Zappa <laughs> drum solo, you know, and I felt confident enough to, sure. let's see if I can. And I, uh, they liked it. So uh, I just kept doing that and uh, expanding my kit and kind of making it a goal to make the drum set, uh, approach it like an orchestra and uh, like a, an organ player can play bass with his feet, and mm -hmm. something with his left hand, something with his right hand. So that's kind of the, uh, the angle I took, was to make uh, real music on the drums. Right. Now it's expanded to the point where the left half of my kit is chromatic, and the right half is diatonic, and I got all the white notes, diatonic notes in my bass drums. Mm -hmm. So um, I, can, I have it doubled with um, uh, the, a MIDI note, just a sine wave to reinforce the pitch and um, you know, I can make real music on the drums. So. Sure. And then for me personally, the, the, the peak of my lifetime was probably in the you know, early 70s when you had Miles Davis elevating jazz to the level of modern chamber music. Uh, you had uh, Weather Report taking influences from all over the world, whether it be electronic music and uh, you know, ambient music, uh, jazz, you know, improvisation, funk, uh, ethnic percussionists from around the world. Joe Zawinul and Wayne Schur had a classical background, so they were, you know, consummate mm -hmm. musicians. And they all improvised in a compositional manner. Right. So that's what I try and do. And in a way, I try and keep a groove, uh, you know, play some melodies like Miles or Joe would play, 
uh, and then add little splashes of percussion. Uh, and in order to do that, I've created this big monster kit that has all right. those colors and right. sounds. Which is amazing. Yeah. Which is amazing. It's a load of fun for me, you yeah. know. Not yeah. the easiest thing to uh, sell because it takes a paragraph to explain what it is I do. And <laughs> right. most people think drum solo. No. Right, right. But you balance that against other uh, musical styles and things that you work in. Um, one that uh, really caught my ear was Guitar Shop. Yeah, Jeff with, Beck. with Jeff Beck. Yeah, he's and just. I, I read amazing. that you actually recorded that in two passes. You recorded the kick drum and the snare drum separately, and then layered the other stuff on top. Is that correct, no. or is that a rumor? No, that's. There's all kinds of rumors floating around. Okay. Um, I've done. You know, I've worked in a anything you can do in the studio where you're under the gun and you've got uh, an expensive place you're renting engineers and what have you, and people depending on you to get something right. Mm -hmm. And for one reason or another, if something doesn't work, you got to move on and try it a different way. Sure. So, for example, with uh, the first Missing Persons album, uh, I, I found I was pulling the time just a little bit, doing these crashes uh, and kicks for the, some, some of the music uh, while keeping a steady 4-4 bass drum. Mm -hmm. It seemed to work live, but in the studio when it's under a microscope, that wasn't flying. So Ken suggested, let's, you know, make a tape loop of the 4-4 the bass drum, right. and then you can, you know, play the top part of the kit along with it. And uh, that way you won't be pulling the, the you know, the, the timekeeping function. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. And so we did that on a couple tunes and it worked. Then the second record, I started playing electronic drums, the Simmons drums, and they just sucked, you know. I just couldn't <laughs> groove on them. It just didn't work. Right. So uh, I said, well, I know my parts. I'm going to go home with my Lin drum, program everything exactly the way I want it, and leave space exactly where I'll do a fill. And I overdubbed the fills later. And that was that. Mm -hmm. thing. When we went out live, no problem. You know, you play it and nobody, you know, uh, nobody notices anything. But by then I had built my own electronic drum kit that actually, you know, worked. It had sensitivity and uh, multiple sounds per pad and all that kind of junk. Right. So then, uh, you know, other, other records, you just do whatever is called for. I've done things where there's a, a beatbox happening that's just so cool that the hybrid blend between my acoustic drums and what I'm doing in the beatbox makes this thing that, that you wouldn't want to mess with. So mm -hmm. you leave the beatbox in and there's the, you know, the acoustic drums. Right. And uh, so, yeah, but, but with Jeff Beck, I don't think we ever did that. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was pretty much live. He's a, he's a live, spontaneous guy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, ridiculous. I mean, if you're in a room and he plays a note, it's like you've never heard a guitar before, <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't, I don't compliment lightly but that guy's just a genius. He, he's touched by God, you know, his yeah. sound, his feel, just amazing. Right, right. I was blown away. Yeah, yeah. You've worked with a number of amazing guitarists. Yeah, I've been uh, a lucky guy. Back where Frank Zappa, obviously. <laughs> Zappa was uh, amazing too. Alan Holdsworth, Holdsworth Steve Vai, you know, about, David yeah. Torn. Yeah. Um, I, I like to ask musicians that are in these interviews, what is it that makes a great musician like that? What is it that makes somebody a great guitarist or a great bass player? This is a subjective thing, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, I, I came off the road with Jeff Beck and B.B. King, right? So I heard real guys playing the blues like, you know, you never heard it before. Right. And uh, I went in to see a friend of mine when I used to live in Austin play at the Saxon Pub. Mm -hmm. His name's Omar Dykes, and he's a blues guy from sure. Mississippi. He has Omar and the Howlers, mm -hmm. been a Texas road band right, institution band, yeah. for ages. And that guy, you know, is self-taught, and I play with him all the time. I used to play with him all the time there. And, uh, man, I, w I walked in, and I heard that, and I said, this is the real deal, you know? So it's totally subjective. You can have somebody like uh, Buddy Rich, who's a technical phenomenon, or Billy Cobham. Then you have somebody like Ringo Starr or Charlie Watts, who are the perfect guys for the Beatles and the Stones, and, you know, you couldn't, juxtapose those guys you know mm -hmm. Charlie couldn't do what Buddy does and Buddy can't play in the Rolling Stones so it's a very subjective thing right so technique uh, kind of takes a second place to me you have to have a certain amount of technique no matter what it is if it's a unschooled technique or a feel technique like like Omar has he can just make you cry and uh, or, or somebody like Alan Holdsworth who's like Coltrane on the guitar or beyond I've never heard anybody do what he can do mm -hmm. you know, just phenomenal but there's a soul to to uh alan's playing that uh maybe isn't there with uh, another technical guitarist like a shredder or something you sure. know, it's just so what i look for is uh, a guy who doesn't play scale form exercises at a great rate of speed you know 
we all know what he's doing and it's like predictable and stuff. Miles always said, you know, don't play any of that crap you've been practicing. You know, I mm -hmm. want you to be in the moment and play what you feel on stage. So, uh, you know, that's that's kind of where I come from. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I like to find musicians who have really studied, have a, a, a fully developed character, as Zappa used to say. Right. And, uh, you know, who, who have found their own voice and uh, who don't sound like anybody else and are willing to risk and be in the moment with w what's happening in an ensemble and try and improvise in a compositional manner, not mm -hmm. just, you know, I'm gonna do this shred lick or the bass player's gonna do this because that's what his shtick is or I'm gonna do an ostinato because that's what I do. Right. You know, half the time when I'm improvising with, with a group like uh, Holtzworth and Levin and uh, uh, Pat Mastellato and myself, I would think, oh, maybe I could do this and I probably could have, but then somebody else does something and then you go, oh no, that could never fit. So then the whole thing morphs in a different direction. Right. And. Uh, it gives you gives the listener this one time only never to be repeated uh, listening event that you never know what's going to be happening next and to me that is the excitement and the magic of of live music you know right. i don't want to go out there and be the human jukebox you know i don't want to do i don't want to repeat myself mm -hmm. you know so i kind of take from you know ethnic percussion from around the world from jazz because of the improvisation and then uh, you know classical because that's the language of music and you know one should be familiar with all the compositional techniques and musical terms so you can uh, you know play the drums not only rhythmically but harmonically and melodically and mm -hmm. and uh, you know orchestrally or you know with different sounds and colors and textures. Sure. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's my thing. So, uh, you know, and then in terms of working, uh, working relationships, uh, if somebody gives me space, uh, I'll go inside and something will come out. Uh, if somebody starts telling me what to do right away, then I start to choke up. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, most of the best producers uh, are just like have kid gloves and like, you know, really good bedside manner. Right. And uh, a lot of the musicians that I uh, want to play with again, like a David Torn or a Jeff Beck, are, are always that way. They're never telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, other, other guitarists or, or musicians I've played with are just control freaks. And that's the way they work. They're more uh, like a, a composer type of musician who, mm -hmm. you know, have to work everything out structurally and they need exactly this here and that there. And that's what they want you to do. And then you feel more like a session guy or a studio musician who's just trying to, you know, punch out cans in a factory. Right. So, right. So I try and stay away from those unless I really need money. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you, you mentioned improvisation, and I saw you play with uh, uh, Torn Levin and Mastellato at NAMM, mm -hmm. I think it was last year or two years ago. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was like a 45, 50 minute set, and I think you did two songs. Yeah. When you go into a, a, a gig like that where it's largely improvisation. Do you go in with a germ of an idea? Do you have basically any structure or does somebody just start playing? No, no, nothing. Nothing at all. It's like those guys I trust with my life and I hope they feel the same about me and nothing needs to be said. Tony Levin, what are you going to say? I mean, he's just right. a genius. He's his palette with all his instruments and looping and, you know, bowing and plucking and funk fingers. I mean, what could you ask? There isn't a bass player I know on earth who has as many uh, colors and, and sounds and possibilities that, you know, he can play three parts at once on a stick. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you got, uh, you know, uh, well, we, we were improvising with Holdsworth and he can just do whatever he wants. He's perfect. And Torn's my old friend and uh, same way in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I trust him with my life. Whatever you want to do, we'll make it happen. And Pat Mastellato's the same way. He's uh, just got that electronic palette. You never know what you're going to hear from him, whether it's going to be a voice or some strange Tibetan bells or, right. you know, or, or a Bonham-like feel. He's got the wonderful pocket, you know. Mm -hmm. So that just takes all this pressure off me having to be the drummer and then suddenly I can just color and play and you know have right. fun dance around it all so yeah I, I and and then you know uh, to the best of my uh, uh, own devices you know if I go out by myself I have certain ostinatos I know I can play over mm -hmm. some of them have themes that fit and I keep that and you can call it a composition but my compositions are open-ended and so if I come up with something great I might include that in the composition and then it grows over, over the years. Mm -hmm. But so I only have that to depend on. Like I know I'm going to do certain ostinatos or I'll play to a certain tape loop that has some ambient loops and uh, stuff like that. But 
other than that, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I like that. Yeah, fun. But, uh, you know, you need, uh, I mean, for me personally, I think for everybody, we all have a, a vocabulary. And so we're going to dip into our vocabulary uh, a bit. But we don't talk about it and we don't um, enforce it. You know, my mm -hmm. idea of a band is uh, absolute unconditional acceptance of all the members and their ideas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if I know this bass player does that and I don't like that, then I don't ask him to play. Mm -hmm. But with Tony Levin, he can play whatever he wants. With David Torn, please, knock yourself out. Mastelato, do whatever you want. Right. You know, those guys, uh, you know, Mick Karn is another one, just brilliant bass player. Sounded mm -hmm. like he was backwards and like nobody else. And uh, it just, I'm just waiting for him to, I would never think of telling him what to do. You right. Know? Just do whatever you want, man. It's, it's great, all yeah. of it. Yeah, right. Now you're also a composer though, because you've written your chamber works and had those performed. Do you approach that differently from improvising or do you start those from an improvisation or where do those compositions come from? Uh, co composition just means to put together. So nowadays you've got so many options. Uh, it's almost like uh, Stravinsky said, I like restrictions. So, you know, sometimes I, I will say, okay, I'm just going to compose this on reason and I'm just going to look at that MIDI graph and the keyboard on the side and I'm going to put in a couple notes and play it back and go okay this note will go under that and and then if I like the way it sounds great you know and then right. you know you chip away at that late at night and then in the morning you listen to it and, and you go wow that's good and it inspires you to keep going on so I've, I've composed that way uh, the chamber works actually came from the ostinato compositions I was doing and uh, somebody would said to me you know why don't you uh, get a guy to write some orchestral music to go along with that because it's so orchestral. And uh, I said, you know, I, I can't do that. I, what if somebody wrote all this stuff and I don't like that? <laughs> and I couldn't figure out how to do it myself. So then one day I, I was in my garage and I, I uh, hit my drums and I kind of measured what the pitch was and uh, wrote down an overhead chart of what the pitches were on my uh, drums. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to start there. So when I do this piece, it's just da, 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 these three notes. Okay, and now I could assign that to a cello or that could be the bass line or that could just be an inner voice and I could reharmonize, I could put this on top of it and it just exploded. Hmm. So I wrote all that stuff just kind of that way. Uh, I think I was using some music program and I put some markers and <clears throat> said, okay, this is the part where I do this on the bells. So. I put a little bell marker and when I got there I'd orchestrate that and before I knew it I had all this music put together and uh, right. I did it with MIDI and then put that out and then that um, encouraged uh, a guy in um, Holland to ask me to perform it with the um, Metropole Orchestra over there and uh, Steve Vai released that on his uh, uh, What's it called? Um, Favorite Nations. The Favorite Nations, yeah, distributed it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, yeah, that's kind cool. of a, a masterwork. And it's a lot of hard work. I did it before just with a, a chamber group. And, um, you know, the dynamics are very difficult with a drum set and, and an orchestra. So, mm -hmm. Metropole is not afraid to electrify and they wear monitors. And so we could hear each other and play with each other very well. Nice. So, yeah. But yeah, that, and I have so much music. Uh, you know, other times I'll use um, Sibelius and I'll just write, you know, that way. Or I'll take a MIDI file from something I did in Sibelius if I want other people to play it. And uh, I'll put, or that I wrote in uh, Reason and put it into Sibelius. And then you auto-correct and make sure it's a chart somebody can read and mm -hmm. maybe play with a, a Tosca strings in Austin mm -hmm. and uh, do some things like that. Uh, other times I make ambient stuff with Pro Tools, uh, just tweak sounds to the point where, you know, it's it's really weird or, uh, you know, blow a few notes into a looper with a flute and right. you know, harmonize it or use a vocorder on it, uh, do, do all kinds of bizarre stuff. So any way you can compose, you know, is, is a good way to compose and right. you just kind of got to follow through and... Uh, Make sure that, you know, for me, uh, make sure I don't go, oh, God, you know, and get overwhelmed with all the possibilities right. that we have. Right, right, exactly. So you mentioned Stravinsky, and uh, uh, you've said in the past you're a fan of 20th century composers, oh, people yeah. like Stravinsky, Bartok, Cowell, of course, Frank Zappa as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you draw from that for inspiration? What do you look for from that music? You know, 
some composers just move me and then you read about what what's behind it and you go oh my god there's a meaning to all this like the rite of spring didn't need an explanation mm -hmm. right but then that's a ballet and this is about a human sacrifice in you know ancient uh, russia or what have you sacrificing a girl to the bears for you know a, a good uh, year of crops or something and right. you know man uh, all that behind that all that meaning so then i read stravinsky's books and he's just so self-effacing you know he here's this icon of 20th century music and he says well i compose by an act of delectation and i'm like what the hell is delectation <laughs> right so i look it up in the dictionary and it says to find delight in hmm. so he goes and and he also compared the act of co composition to uh, the same as a pig foraging for truffles so, you know, you stick your nose in the dirt until you find something that smells good, right? So when he, on that pedestal I've got him on, says, that's all there is to it, uh, you know, I thought, man, maybe I can do some of this because those guys broke all the rules. So mm -hmm. there's no more Bach, you know, you can't have parallel fifths or, you know, you can't use this note with that note. You can use any note with any note. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it sounds good to you, that's fine. So you have this, you know, visual of, of Stravinsky who used to compose on a uh, out-of-tune, uh, felt muffled piano so nobody in the next room could hear what he was composing because mm -hmm. if they heard it and stole it you know he's very protective sure. so you just think no no ah and then he writes <laughs> a whole piece out of those four notes or something you know because that right. delighted him so uh, that gave me the kind of uh, okay you know uh, to, to uh, make mistakes and just make something for me that nobody had to hear and uh, then, you know, maybe you play it for a friend or somebody else and, and they like it and give you a little encouragement and you follow through and before you know it, it's, it's a piece of music and it lives and it's out there and people have heard it and responded to it. And, you know, so that's the way those guys have uh, inspired me. I, I love Stravinsky. I love Ravel and Debussy. Uh, I love Messien. I love Varese. Uh, and you'll hear all those influences in, in my music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, st I don't think I'm doing anything new, but, uh, you know, there's certain effects they used that uh, I will try to simulate. And I put them together the way I put them together. And, uh, you know, with my filter of, uh, you know, the, the limitations of uh, what I know and, uh, and the, the tastes I have of uh, what I think are, you know, desirable. Right. And then there it is. So right. I can't really be responsible, you know. Uh, I, I really feel something comes through you that's from the subconscious, and uh, it's just my job to uh, open up and, and let it go out there and follow through with it, you know. Right, right. In in today's music world, you know, mistake is almost a dirty word, mm -hmm. and everything is perfected and polished. How do you have the courage, as a musician or as a composer, to let go and both improvise and to compose in that way? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's just, you know, uh, people are born with certain affinities. And, and as you grow and are exposed to experiences, uh, you have an affinity for it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And every, in every walk of life, you name it, architecture, these guys like Le Corbusier or, uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright or, uh, uh, you know, Marcel Breuer or uh, Mies van der Rohe, when they built a building, that's the day architecture changed. Mm -hmm. I see a chair and then I go, wow, that chair is so cool and modern looking, right? And it was made in the 20s. And I'm like, what? Right. Black leather and rolled chrome tubing in the 20s? Mm -hmm. I had no idea this was done way back then. Who did this? I find his architecture, you know, this guy Le Corbusier. So, you know, I go, oh my God, you know, these guys were innovators. They were, they were giants, you know. Mm -hmm. Then in, in painting, you know, Picasso or Van Gogh or somebody who just did something that when they painted, that's the day painting changed. Mm -hmm. When Miles Davis played the trumpet, that's the day trumpet playing changed. You know, when Stravinsky goes, uh, composed, that's the day music changed. Mm -hmm. Those guys, I don't know why, are always the ones that I go, I like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I haven't got much courage and, and, and you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, anybody great, but I just can't help but being magnetically drawn towards those kinds of things. And, and it's, it's scary, but you know, what am I going to do? You know, I, sure. if, if somebody asked me to play something, you know, in a stupid group or something, 
If I could find something simple to play that I really enjoyed, like playing the blues with Omar Dykes, mm -hmm. you know, no problem, man, I'm there because there's some feeling thing. But if I felt, oh, this group is just, God, how many times have I heard that since the 60s, okay? And they're asking me to play this simple stuff and tour with them. I'd have to be really broke before I took that, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd have to be starving. Because for me, uh, I just can't get away from wanting to do what these heroes of mine did. Sure. And uh, so that's, that's how I do it. And somehow God's just let me, you know, from the time I was about 22, and I'm 62 now, so that's 40 years. You know, uh, I've been on unemployment a couple times, but you know, I've, I've been able to live and do what I love. And that's better than, uh, you know, not doing what you love and having a yacht or playing golf, which I don't do either of those things. Right. I don't care to do either of those things. Sure, but what you do have is an amazing drum kit. Yeah, I do. And that's thanks to John Good and DW. They've yeah. given me, you know, I have an idea, I say, hey Don, can you take the double pedal and switch it up backwards? So I have a pedal here and a remote bass drum out there past my floor toms. And he goes, yeah, right. we can do that. So then I got this big bass drum out there that, you know, it's just an amazing thing. And, and little by little, we've uh, just expanded and pushed drumming, you know, to the point where most people don't, don't have an inkling of, about the sophistication of what I have and what's available to them, mm -hmm. you know, nor do they want it or, or have to use it, you know. But for me, I've invented little tuners to lock the tuning in for my drums sure. because m melody and being in tune is really important. Uh, I have these little beater ball enhancers I invented so you can get a tambourine jingle uh, making that sound along with your bass drum when you hit it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it expands the or orchestral uh, you know, dimensions of your drum kit. So all those kinds of things uh, and, and my radius cymbals from um, you know, Sabian are, are uh, you know, a work of art as well. They, they, may sound clunky or not right to, to the normal drummer, but, uh, you know, and, and I get asked that all the time, do you use those in a session? Because yeah, mm -hmm. they're made for playing uh, more melodically, so mm -hmm. they have more of a fundamental pitch and they're a little bit softer, so they balance with the, the volume of my drums because I use one, basically one mic, you know, above my head to kind of get the mm -hmm. overall kit sound, so mm -hmm. balance is important. And um, you know, they'll, they'll ask me, do you use other symbols? And well, no, you know, I use them with corn. Is that, that okay with you or with, you know, <laughs> or with BLS? And I mean, you know, you can right. hear, they sound really good. So um, you may get a mic tighter up on them and, uh, and all, but I've never had any complaints with all the sessions I've done and using my techniques and my little things, even if it's just a little, wow, well, you hear a horn section go, you know, da 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 ba ba da ba da and so if I do on two stereo hi-hats that are panned left and right, I've never had an arranger or producer go, oh, don't do that. You know, mm -hmm. they go, right. oh, sh that's a great idea, you know, and, uh, yeah, right. okay, I love it. Right. So, you right. know, I've been lucky. I've been very lucky. But I would expect that at this point in your career, people are bringing you in to do what you do. Yeah, for the most part, that's what they do. And, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, I, you know, left to my own devices, I think I can do something that uh, will satisfy most most uh, anybody. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not somebody who wants to, you know, I know where the focus is. And uh, if the focus is not about the drums, uh, you know, I've learned lessons. I've, uh, with Robbie Robertson, uh, I did three takes on um, that song Broken Arrow mm -hmm. on his first solo record. It's a beautiful ballad. It, when he played it for me, when I met Robbie, I cried. I, I, I'm a total stranger, Robbie Robertson, icon. Right? Right. And here I am, the rock guy comes in, he wants to use me on some tracks, and I hear this tune, and I just started crying. It was such a beautifully written tune, mm -hmm. and uh, the imagery and everything. So he said, you gotta be the guy to play on that. <laughs> right. So we did three takes. I did kind of a, um, you know, a linear Bozio kind of uh, beat, and then I did a, a one that was just with mallets on toms, and then uh, he was working with uh, Daniel Lenoir at the time. And uh, we set my drums up in a smaller studio and he said, Terry, you know what I want? I want just the simplest, humble drum part. Mm -hmm. And he said, humble, that word. So that means stay the f out of the way, you know, just play and don't attract any attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. And all three of those things are in that track mixed together and you can barely hear the drums at all, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I learned that there's times where you've got to not you know, 
be the one who enhances something else or or takes a little attention to yourself mm -hmm. you know right uh, you got to be out of the way mm -hmm. so with a singer you know you you find ways to uh, uh color or sound uh you know a certain a certain way to not uh, detract from the point of uh, their vocals you know mm -hmm. or somebody else is taking a solo you don't want to you know like in fusion days we had the Billy Cobham's imitation thing, you know, where a guy would do a fast lick and Billy would imitate it. And that became a fad and, and almost, you know, every drummer in the world did that to, you know, the extreme. So now you purposefully don't do that, you know. Right. You try and purposefully find a way. You know, like for me, a lot of times if I play with other drummers, we're so programmed to do a fill at the, the last bar or two to go into one mm -hmm. that I always leave space there. And then they do a fill and then I play my phrase on the one. So it almost becomes like I do a melodic rhythmic phrase that's, you know, when the drummer's going back to playing the beat. Right. So, you know, in that way, I don't step on what he's doing. He doesn't step on what I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's music happens. Right. So, uh, yeah, all those kinds of things you, you need to uh, keep in mind, you know, to, to do the right thing for, for, for the music, you know, because that's, that's the... You know, I mean, everybody says it, but the, the music is the most important thing. And if somebody's paying you, then they're right and you do what they want. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, and it may be a skilled job and you're just trying to, you know, keep the beat, stay out of the way or what have you. And but then there there will be other times where your artistic, uh, you know, ingenuity and expression is is called for. And uh, that's when, you know, you need to be prepared for, for doing something really special. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's few and far between unless you create your own circumstances like Zappa did. Right. But, uh, you know, that it's a balance between those things, uh, you know, to be a good professional. Mm -hmm. When to shut up, stay out of the way. When to uh, take it and, and uh, you know, dominate. Right. In, my, in I have a lot of teaching videos and I talk about aspects of uh, improvisation mm -hmm. and what it's about. And the first rule is to listen, you know. Sure. And then the second rule is you can go with or go against what you hear. You mm -hmm. know, it's just a matter of choice, you know. You can uh, contrast with somebody, you can destroy what somebody's doing, you can step all over it or you can, uh, you know, listen to what it is, stay out of the way, you can enhance it and try and copy it, go with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's all kinds of these contrasting elements that happen in uh, improvisation uh, that uh, are kind of like the guideposts to what to do if you're stumped, you know, like, oh, I don't know what to play. Right. Look at this little list and go, oh, I could do this, you know. <laughs> right, right. That, that uh, reminds me of though, I, was, I uh, interviewed uh, Victor Wooten not long mm -hmm. ago, and we talked about ego mm -hmm. in improvisation. And in order to do what you're talking about there, you have to kind of yeah. subvert your ego and, and bring it back under so you're not saying look at me you're part of the whole process if, yeah if you will and that uh, that comes i think with age if you have that intention first of all mm -hmm. it comes with age a lot of us are you know struggling to try and uh, make a living and and you know go for those motives that i talked about earlier instead of just making music and it takes a while you know before one has the experience to do that you mm -hmm. know I, one of my i don't have any regrets but one regret i have is that you know, I played with Zappa when I was 24, and he was 10 years older than me and a genius. <laughs> so, you know, he really knew a lot. And at 24, I don't know how he put up with the way I played, you know. And I wish I could go back with what I know now. Sure. And uh, the sensibilities I have now and uh, support him behind a guitar solo uh, the way he deserves to be supported, you know. Right. Because I was just thinking, oh, you know, I want to do this big Billy Cobham lick here or a Tony Williams thing there, and you know very immature right so <laughs> but that's something that comes with with as you said with age and with yeah. experience as well exactly. not just age but also just doing it and, and recognizing that in other players and things so, yeah yeah great advice great yeah advice. Derek, thanks so much for coming in oh it's really my pleasure yeah, i hope, just, hope i haven't jawed too much no it's all all wonderful stuff we're so happy to, happy to have a passion about talk music to i could talk to you all day about this okay <laughs> <Good. laughs> well Appreciate thank you so much and we're really looking forward to hearing you play ah me too you know yeah, i live too. for playing so. it's gonna be great outstanding thanks for coming to your fest my pleasure I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.